And of course, uh, welcome back and thanks so much to uh, President Lagarde for her speech. And now I'm joined by Andrea Andrea. Thank you so much, by the way, for putting uh, this conference together. You're the host, the head of supervision at the ECB. We have a very interesting program. Today you brought up some good names, so of course we want to uh, thank you for the event itself. But in terms of the speech that we just heard from the President, there's a lot uh, to unpack. And it was clear that she praised the response to the corona crisis. She says that this was a, from a regulatory, but also the supervision and the response from banks very different to what we've seen in the past. But then she also did say, and this really caught my eye, that this is a banking uh, kind of sphere that is stronger than it was before, but is incomplete. So I wonder, in that respect, would you say that banks, from where you sit, from the supervision, have every incentive that they need in order to create what she says is this leaner, stronger, pan-European banking sphere? Well, uh, I think, first of all, the, 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 uh, President Lagarde was absolutely uh, spot on. Uh, I think that there has been, I would stress also the fact that for the first time, uh, there was a, a strongly coordinated response from the supervisory side and monetary policy side. We came out with our first measures uh, on the same day in March, and I think that was, uh, was a first. Um, but indeed, the, 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 the sector is stronger, more resilient, as a shock absorber, not as a shock amplifier. Um, there are, of course, still issues to be, to be addressed. On the policy side, the point which is probably uh, the one on which I feel some regret as a policymaker is that we have, uh, we have done the banking union, but it's still an incomplete banking union, as uh, President Lagarde referred to. So without the third leg of the deposit guarantee scheme, and, uh, and this means that uh, the European banking market is still segmented mm -hmm. into national buckets to a large extent. Uh, this uh, is somewhat a drag also on the competitiveness of our banking sector, on their ability to reach a scale that enable them to compete globally maybe. So uh, that's an area in which uh, probably there should be some progress to make. And, and what's preventing that? Because I know that you've said the, the, it, it's there, what's needed is there, but we just need to make it happen. The banks say, however, for us it's not that clear and, and perhaps the supervision is not that clear either. Well, I mean, on the, on the, on the, um, on the institutional side, uh, we don't have yet uh, the deposit guarantee scheme at the European level in place, which means that if something goes wrong, the eventual impact goes on the national deposit guarantee scheme. And this is creating some reluctance uh, from member states, which is then crystallized into the regulation to enable banks to freely move capital and liquidity across member states. So for instance, if you are a, a bank and you have a subsidiary in the same member state, you can waive capital and liquidity requirements for the subsidiary and look at the group as a whole. But if you, are, uh, uh, if you have your subsidiary in another member state, still in the banking union, still under the supervision of the ECB, uh, you cannot waive the capital requirements. You need to have capital locally and also the possibility to waive liquidity requirements is constrained. So the math for the banks to really move their business on an integrated basis in the area is still impaired. So you'd say is the liquidity waiver that perhaps is, 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 is th that final step that could scare an institution? Well, uh, having, having the possibility from regulation to have uh, liquidity, capital waivers, uh, would of course uh, make uh, uh, groups able to uh, pool capital and liquidity at the group level and distribute it as, as, they, as they would like. As we have seen it during the crisis, um, there were in several uh, member states, for instance, specific, while we had a, a constraint on dividend payments that was applied at the group level, so basically we didn't want the capital to leave the banking sector, but we were pretty relaxed on the idea that uh, uh, banks were paying dividends to their parent company, for instance, within the banking union. Uh, there have been a number of national measures which have constrained this type of payments of dividends. So capital was basically not flowing freely. And this, of course, uh, has an impact on the way in which banks plan their, their, their business and, uh, and, 
and uh, you know and develop their franchise across the banking union and uh, mr Enria, not, not to get too political but it does seem that this conversation at times goes around in circles that there is nothing no new impetus to advance the agenda on on completing this banking union would you say the parameters are, are, are changing i mean i don't want to get too much into the politics but there's a new government in germany of course president lagarde has been very keen about this pan-european big uh, institutions is there something in this whole context that could change and move it forward well you know uh, my my attitude is hope for the better and prepare for the worse <laughs> so uh, I know that the political discussions on this issue are very difficult I hope they will get unlocked because we need a complete banking union uh, to really create a domestic market uh, for 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 European banks at the at the euro area level um, uh, but I think that if this doesn't happen, we need to do our best to make the banking union work within the current setting. I mean, the banking union already has a supervision leg that is working effectively. We have a resolution leg that is working effectively. And uh, uh, we do have some uh, uh, hooks in the current regulatory framework that could enable banks uh, to move uh, cross-border in a smoother way. Uh, we have proposed, for instance, to use uh, the liquidity waivers which are already available in the legislation uh, by maybe providing intra-group guarantees that could provide sufficient reassurance to the host member states that uh, the local establishment would not be left with the losses if something goes wrong, that would be supported by the parent. And we, I also argued recently that maybe also the model of relying on branches could be used more. It is there since 1992, since the start of the single market. It has not been used that much because in the past, of course, if you transform the subsidiary into a branch, there would have been a shift of supervised responsibility from the host authority to the home authority. Now, in the banking union, the supervision is always with the ECB, and nothing would change in terms of involvement of the national authorities in supervision, so the issue could be less sensitive and maybe relying on branches. I've seen the banks that have relocated after Brexit have, to a large extent, rely, relied on, uh, on branches, incorporating all the subsidiaries into the parent and branching out throughout the banking union. So it could be something also for European banks to think about. So uh, not, not to put words in your mouth, but essentially what it looks like is uh, to me is that you're saying there's a lot already that you can work with yeah. within the current framework. So don't drag your feet and don't blame us for. Well, and especially don't wait the, for again for something to happen that resolves all the problems. Uh, I mean, sometimes uh, my, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the best could be the enemy of the good, no? So let's try to do the best of <laughs> what we have right now and to make the banking union progress. And, you know, that's, that's on the supervision, but I wonder, uh, you know, just to go back in time and also add context to uh, the words of uh, President Lagarde, with the dividends, of course, during the pandemic, you decided we're going to put this on hold, and now you're back to business as usual. But I wonder, having time to go in, or the time to go back in hindsight, is that a measure that you say has been vindicated, validated, it proved you wrong? Because for the banks, it was very painful. Uh, or yeah, I think I, if, if, I, <laughs> yeah. Uh, if I were to go back, I would say I would do exactly the same choice. Um, uh, it was uh, a, an extremely uh, high level of uncertainty we were facing. We didn't know what would have happened in terms of uh, the speed of the recovery, whether there would have been a recovery, how long uh, the, the pandemic would have, uh, would have stayed with us. Uh, we didn't know uh, that uh, su public support measures would have been effective as they have been. It was essential at that moment to preserve capital, mm -hmm. to, let's say, to put capital aside, to make sure the banks were, uh, you know, able to uh, support the economy and also to absorb losses that could be coming. We had estimates of potential non-performing loans that were uh, also pretty high. So, uh, so I think it was the right uh, choice uh, to make. Uh, it's interesting also to, to notice that it worked, no? In terms of, there is a, um, an interesting study done by the Banco de España that shows, because uh, our decision came in the middle of the um, AGM season in Spain. So some banks had paid dividends, some didn't, because our uh, recommendation came through. And it is clear that the banks that did not pay dividends because they were distributing after uh, the, the decision have lent more mm -hmm. into the real economy. So there is a, a relevant differential in lending. So the, the, the decision has been important to support lending at that difficult juncture. So it was an important decision. Let me, let me say clearly, we say it up front, 
It was an exceptional measure for exceptional times. We don't want this to be an ordinary tool in our box, and uh, we are now going back to, uh, let's say, business as usual. Okay, because that was my, my follow-up question. Given that in the time of crisis, and again, this was a, a one-off crisis that was huge, no one could have imagined a pandemic, but you're saying it's uh, this is not the playbook that could be used repeatedly. You really view this as one-off and that's it, I, I guess because also the shock to a bank's business model is big. Yeah, and, and generally, I mean, we as supervisors, as microprudential supervisors, want to intervene looking at the individual situation of banks. These sort of blanket, one-size-fits-all interventions, I mean, we don't like to take them, and we wouldn't take them in, uh, uh, if not in such extraordinary circumstances. So that's nef definitely not uh, something that we want to repeat. We are now back to the usual approach of looking at the bank's uh, capital plans, how they project their capital, how robust their capital plans are, and if they have capital trajectories that are, uh, you know, comfortably above our, our requirements, then we wouldn't interfere at all with the, with the bank's distribution plan. Right, so you make it clear this sets no precedent in terms of, yeah. uh, because as some in the industry could have said, well, given that it was used once, it could be a tool that gets repeated, but your message is clear that this is a one-off for a one-off crisis of a magnitude that's, that was very big. No, there has been also, I mean, uh, uh, there have been some uh, members of parliament in, uh, that have requested us whether we would like to have a, a specific legal power mm -hmm. to do this again in the future. And, uh, and we say that we don't need it, uh, that uh, we don't plan to, uh, to use it again, that this was extraordinary, and if in the future, touch wood, there were <laughs> another <laughs> pandemic or another difficult situation, let's say we could count on the, on the banks uh, following our recommendations. They were all very disciplined. Uh, and let's really touch wood that we don't get yeah, to see indeed. anything of the, of the likes. Uh, I wonder, however, you know, the, the economy right now, it's, it's very difficult uh, to get full visibility of where this is going. You know, on the one hand, we have the European recovery that was gaining a lot of momentum. Now we have the bottlenecks, the shortage economy economy, potentially a new wave. So this is, uh, first of all, it's very difficult to read, but then it's also triggering a lot of talk around, however, some of the inflationary pressures that we may be getting, whether this is sticky or not. And of course, it takes you to the interest rate uh, conversation. The market and banks, of course, are salivating for this. The ECB is pushing back, saying this, this is not yet and we're not there satisfied with the conditions to hike and lift. But I wonder, in terms of supervision, in terms of what banks may be uh, thinking down the line in the next year, what what does it mean for you? Well, first of all, um, we, um, we have seen a, a, a positive uh, uh, season for profitability. Mm -hmm. Profitability of banks bounced back uh, uh, more than everybody expected. Uh, this is driven to some extent by reduced impairment and uh, uh, release of provisions. Um, and of course, uh, as a supervisor, we are always, you know, inviting uh, uh, banks to caution. No, I mean, as you say, the, the, the macroeconomic outlook is still clouded with uncertainty, and uh, uh, we would uh, call on banks uh, to, you know, remain prudent and uh, cautious in, in this uh, in this in this respect, because still we have uh, um, a positive credit risk outlook. Banks are projecting a continued decrease in uh, non-performing loans in the coming year, but we also have uh, the, uh, the, the, the withdrawal of uh, public support measures that is likely to come in 2022. So we need to see how the uh, supported customers will, uh, will fare once the, the support measures will not be there uh, anymore. In terms of interest rates, let's say, um, Banks have uh, um, the, the impact of the low interest rate environment on, uh, on banks' balance sheets has been uh, a net positive for a while. Until uh, June of last year, the second quarter of last year, the positive impact on uh, lending, on the lending volumes, had more than compensated for the uh, negative impact on the, on the margins. No? Uh, this has changed recently, so the negative impact on margins has started prevailing and, and, and has uh, in, impacted on, uh, on the dynamics of the rent interest, interest income. Um, but banks have been able to compensate that, especially through revenues uh, in uh, trading, 
and uh, net fees and commissions. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting environment, and what I, what I say is that it is positive that banks diversify their sources of income, but it's especially important and positive because some banks are starting to do it, that they start being more serious about cost optimization, looking to the branch network they have, invest in digitalization, uh, maybe considering mergers as potential options to refocus their business model and restore profitability on a more sustainable basis. Uh, on the basis of your answer, I have two questions that I want to follow up with. But the first one is, then what would you respond to the many CEO, CFO, I know we speak to, to many on Bloomberg, and they come on and they say the negative interest rate environment has made our business very, very difficult. It's not easy to make money. So they paint a, a picture that is not perhaps as, as nuanced as what you described, but they say it's, it's very hard out there for a European bank. Well, I mean, uh, I, the, the, the point I'm making is based on uh, empirical analysis and facts. So it's not, uh, let's say, a sort of uh, personal opinion. Th that there will be, there will be uh, soon, I think, the financial stability review of the ECB will be published where there will be uh, evidence of, uh, of this. Uh, but I understand, I mean, working uh, in a low interest environment uh, has been difficult for banks. I don't deny that. I mean, it's clear that uh, uh, for banks that have uh, traditionally, you know, built their business on, uh, on interest margins, if you work with, uh, with, uh, with a low interest rate environment, it's more difficult. Uh, still, I think that the, um, the, 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 the main point is the structural weakness of the European banking sector. This, this is a conjunctural aspect. It will, at some time, you know, be normalized. The real point is the structural weaknesses that we have. And this means uh, low cost efficiency, a cost to income ratio that is stuck at 65% since a long time, um, return on equity, which has been for a decade now below the cost of equity. So the sector, on average, is burning capital. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, business models which are, in some cases, do not look sustainable in the longer term. So banks need to work on this. These are the levers that they have in their hands. They need to pull these levers and, uh, and try to restore profitability on a more sustainable basis. And uh, Mr. Henry, I wonder, uh, given what you say, do you worry that perhaps all this forward-looking chat on the rate uh, side is going to distract banks from what you say is fundamentally a structural issue that, that, that they could be doing already now? I, 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 I don't know, I'm turning a little bit more positive. I, I hope that uh, I'm comforted by the future developments. Uh, I think for a long while, banks have been just waited for, you know, uh, the interest rate environment to change and their margins being, uh, you know, beefed up by a change in the, in the, in the, in the interest rates. Uh, I think the pandemic has been a turning point to some extent because, uh, uh, I, I met several CEOs that told me how surprised, positively surprised they were by the increase in productivity mm -hmm. that was uh, realized uh, in the first lockdowns by starting to distribute their services uh, digitally to their customers. And, uh, and I think that this has made several bankers, boards, uh, thinking about, you know, uh, biting the bullet and changing their business in a, more radical, in a more radical way. And we see, it's still anecdotal, you don't see anything at the level of aggregate data, but if you try to look at some uh, specific, uh, uh, let's say, cases, you see banks that have reduced significantly uh, their, their branch network, for instance. Also, banks that traditionally were advocating branches, uh, brick and mortar banking as an important uh, brand for them. Uh, you see that uh, uh, banks have invested more in digital platforms, payments platforms, uh, in restoring, the, in uh, renewing their IT infrastructure. Uh, you see that uh, also MAs, uh, besides the overall uh, engagement in, in mergers and acquisition, which is the most transformational step in terms of business model that you can take, uh, you see also that uh, um, uh, banks have started selling or buying business lines. So in asset management, uh, custody business, uh, payment platforms, leasing, uh, uh, which means that they are trying to rebalance their business model and make it more sustainable in the long term. So I think that uh, they are moving towards, uh, you know, really 
the structural repair that is needed rather than just waiting for interest rates, and I hope they don't disappoint me <laughs> in the coming months. <laughs> you mentioned uh, many good points there. The one uh, that, that kind of got me thinking uh, with the pandemic and the fallout from the pandemic, would you say it puts an end to the branch model of banks? Putting an end is, is too strong, I would mm. say. Uh, but indeed, uh, let's say, I think that uh, banks have started rethinking. I mean, the, 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 the density of the branch network, especially in some countries, in some business models, has been very, 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 very high. And, uh, and this can be rethought. I mean, and, and maybe also, you know, I, I, I met a banker that, to, that told me, and I found that interesting, that uh, in the past, no, the, the the customer and, uh, and the bank met in the branch. Uh, now, during the pandemic, they started meeting more and more on the, on the smartphones, on the internet, on the, on the devices of the customer. Uh, one development that could be interesting is that uh, the customer and the banks might meet instead also in, uh, in virtual platforms, like uh, in the places where uh, goods are sold, for instance, and uh, providing services directly when you buy uh, specific uh, goods. So I think everything is changing very fast. Banks need to be very alert and to, um, and to move, uh, move fast in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this area. But this is, uh, this is really, uh, uh, I think that the highest risk now for banks is just standing still. And of course, uh, the other risk, which you alluded to, and also uh, President Lagarde pointed to, is the damage that the, this may do to the real economy. And now we're still in a situation where governments, to some extent, are continuing to support and provide measures to businesses, to small and medium-sized. When do you think we get to a point where the full impact of this pandemic is seen in banks, and you really get to have a clear view of the damage that's been done? Because until now, I guess it's fair to say, in terms of MPLs, it looks better than expected. You know, I mean, I, I think that I'm, I, I started very much uh, in this mindset, no, that uh, there would have been a significant impact mm -hmm. in, uh, in NPLs. That I mean, this was, as uh, President Lagarde said, the, the harshest recession in uh, peacetime Europe. No, I mean, so it's uh, it's uh, surprising uh, that so far there hasn't been any almost any materialization mm -hmm. in terms of NPS. And NPS started continued decreasing. Um, so um, it is possible that, of course, there is a materialization of MPLs, a cyclical materialization of MPLs once the uh, support measures are, uh, are withdrawn. And we have been very, um, very pushy with banks in, the, in our supervisory cycle this year in asking banks to enhance their risk controls. So to start uh, you know, managing uh, credit risk deterioration early, effectively, classifying properly the loans, flagging forbearance. I think we have done an excellent work, and this should strengthen the ability of the banks uh, to withstand uh, uh, any potential uh, shock uh, still coming. But I don't think that the, the real issue is uh, the impact of a cyclical downturn. I think that this pandemic has brought about uh, important structural changes. I mean, also the, the response to the pandemic, the next generation EU, for instance, mm -hmm. is very much focused, as President Lagarde also said, on uh, investments in uh, digitalization, in, uh, in green. So there will be an imp important changes. Also, the way in which uh, uh, we work. I mean, will there be more reliance on remote working? What impact this would have on certain sectors, like, such as commercial real estate, for instance? So th there could be the recovery might be less even, I mean, will not just restore the economy as it was before the pandemic. There will be structural changes coming through, which means that there will be winners and losers. And the losers will be on the side of the MPLs in the, bank, in the balance sheet of the bank. So we need to be still careful for a while, I think. And, and for a while, how, how long is that? I, I know it's hard to put a, a well, time you know, on I mean, this, as, but super, as supervisors, we're always, uh, we always have to look into creators. We will never stop doing so. But I think it, will, it won't only be an issue of months. It, it will be an issue of years. Of years, OK. And uh, in terms of uh, an issue of year, perhaps this year, it is true that we haven't seen, uh, we talked about this before, 
scandals, uh, big problems in uh, the European uh, banking industry. Uh, we did have one, or we did have one uh, with the Archegos and the fallout from that, which was pretty significant. Is that a reminder, perhaps, of the pockets of risk that you may see out there? And, and, and in particular, when you look at specific pockets, is there anything that would kind of focus your attention? There's been a lot of talk about leverage loans, perhaps. Yeah, let, let me start with your point on scandals. Um, I think there is a, an important issue in terms of uh, 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 conduct and culture at mm -hmm. banks. Um, I remember uh, after the great financial crisis, I thought that there, there had been a lot of uh, episodes of misconduct in the, in the past and that this would have been remediated, the pipeline would have dried up and the issue would have been, you know, muted for, for, and I've seen these episodes coming up and up again. So I think that there is a more fundamental issue of culture that has not yet been entirely fixed. And uh, the fact that we didn't see many scandals in the last months is not uh, something that I take as a, 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 an indication that the problem is solved. Uh, we still see, for instance, uh, uh, every time there is, uh, you know, investigative journalists, for instance, bringing up issues such as the Pandora Papers. You always see banks uh, helping maybe uh, customers evading taxes or, or doing money laundering even. I mean, this is something on which I think uh, we, need to, uh, we need to continue keeping working at the bank level, especially the top management, the boards, but also the middle management to get the culture right. And uh, on governance, for instance, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, several um, findings in our, in our supervisory process that take very long to be remediated. So I think that there is a need for more focus on these issues. In terms of the pocket of vulnerabilities, you mentioned Ar Ar Archegos. Archegos uh, let me, uh, made me thinking a lot because uh, um, the report that uh, Credit Suisse uh, wrote, which was, I think, a very good and candid report, um, showed very clearly that there are moments when there is uh, high competition uh, in financial markets, search for yield, in which the business prevails on the risk controls. Uh, and, uh, and, and this is a concern for me, of course. And uh, it is particularly a concern at this juncture in the cycle, because mm -hmm. you do have in, uh, valuations in financial markets are stretched in many segments. Uh, you see financial froth here and there. As you say, you see excessive leverage in some areas. The leverage finance segment is one of those on which we have uh, called banks uh, to enhance their attention so for a while. So that's where you're asking them to. Uh, the prime brokerage in the case of Archegos has also been an important case. Uh, so I, I, I'm very concerned. I mean, you, you were saying before that banks are salivating for higher interest rates. <laughs> that, that's, that I understand that. But if this comes through in a sort of sudden, unexpected shock to interest rates, credit risk spreads, there could be impacts on the market, uh, on the market size and losses that uh, uh, could, uh, you know, be distributed to the financial sector in very unpredictable ways. So banks should be careful what they wish for. And, and, <laughs> and uh, Mr. Enrio, we're running uh, out of time, so I have two very quick questions uh, for you that I'm hoping to fit in. One is you alluded to Brexit before, and you said, uh, well, it was, uh, it was related to something completely different to my question, but you did say with the moving over to continental Europe, there was a lot of use of branches yeah. that was done here. But I do wonder, we haven't seen this huge exodus from the city into continental Europe. Do you think the story has rooms to run it? It is something that could continue in years, or essentially there's no big exodus. The Brexit effect is fully priced in already. From your supervision perspective, the story is done. Look, we agreed with the banks uh, on a target operating model, or now we want them to operate in our, in our jurisdiction. Uh, banks agreed to that. Uh, there was, of course, a suspension in the transition to the target operating model due to the pandemic. It, it would have been extremely harsh of us to ask banks to move uh, staff uh, from London to Frankfurt or Paris or whatever uh, in the euro area during the pandemic. So, of course, we provide banks some slack in terms of uh, their, their relocation plans. We suspended them. Uh, but now we are re-engaging with the banks in terms of, you know, resuming the, uh, the transition in terms of assets and stuff. 
and we expect uh, to reach the target operating model uh, uh, according to the schedule that we agreed with them. And, and just uh, the final, final one, I know I've been saying this for a while now, but in terms of the big European M&A, you know, this is a big story. Who's going to merge with who and when are we going to see this huge giant uh, emerge? I'm not going to ask you for which bank is going <laughs> to get into deal with that. I know you're not going to tell me anyways, but uh, when do you see this happening? I know it's hard to put a date, but is this something that we're looking in the next two, three, five years, or actually this is a story that's way far in the horizon before we get to this point of perhaps fewer, m much stronger, leaner banks, cross-national, well, of course. You, you know, we have had in 2020 320 billions of uh, value in terms of mergers and acquisitions in banking in the, in the, in the banking union. And, uh, and this was the highest value since 2008. So it's already something which is happening. Uh, I'm not surprised that these full-blown mergers uh, uh, across banks uh, are now happening mainly at the domestic level because, of course, the main driver is cost efficiency, mm -hmm. cost savings. And then you, you realize the cost savings if you, if you have an overlapping distribution network and you can cut branches. So uh, at this juncture, it, it's natural that it has mainly a domestic, uh, a domestic uh, dimension. Uh, but of course, if the um, rebound in the economy uh, starts getting strong, as we all hope it mm -hmm. will get in the coming months, I think that the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the case for also uh, looking at mergers as a way for diversifying revenues and strengthening the, the franchise and the balance sheet, I think that uh, that could be a case for uh, cross-border mer mergers to become through. And of course, if we make progress in uh, completing the banking union, this would make the case even stronger. Uh, and, but the timing is pending, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I think that, uh, again, the, the, the moment, I, I'm really convinced that uh, the moment for the structural transformation of the European banking sector is now. We have a lot of different elements that are coming into, into place, and uh, banks need to be uh, able to capture the opportunities. So. Well, Mr. Andrea, thank you so much uh, for your time and, of course, for hosting uh, this conference. It's the fourth annual supervisory conference at the European Central Bank here in Frankfurt. And stay tuned, stay with us, because there are many uh, good panel CEOs, policymakers, all joining us to discuss what is a moment of big change for the European banking industry. Connie? Thank you, Maria. And thank you to President Lagarde, of course, and to the Chair, Andrea and Ria, for those first insights. And those will be carried over into the discussions that are to come. We will now take a short break, and we will resume at 1500 Central European time. So stay tuned, and we'll see you in a bit. Thank you.